Welcome. My name is Amy Golaxon. I'm the president of the Janesville League of Women Voters, and I'm, I'm very pleased to have such a wonderful turnout um, and to welcome Mike McCabe to speak. Um, one of the things that we like to do a little bit at this event in the fall, which we try to have one fun event like this every fall, is to let people know a little bit about the League as well. How many people here are not members of our league or any league. The okay, quite a few. Thank you for coming. Hopefully you weren't scared of the guys that are in the room. I mean, I don't know if any of did any of you hear me on the radio today? No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, that was one of the questions that Tim Bremel said. You know, so tell me about the League of Women Voters. And I said, well, I'm pretty sure most people think that we have a lot to do with voters and a lot to do with women. And the first part is really true, but the second part is not exclusive because we don't do gender bias. We don't roll like that. And he just started laughing. So um, hopefully you feel like you're welcome. And, and uh, what I'd like to do is give you a, just a little bit of a feel of what the league is. Um, yes, we do help voters get registered, but we also um, study the issues year round and we um, write some positions based on that after we come to a consensus of the members. And then we're able to speak to the different governing bodies that we um, have around in the community, you know, city council, county board, um, school board. If, if an issue is coming before them and we, we want to support our representatives to have them know the knowledge that we have because we've read a book and, and had discussions and, and visited with other communities and done the in-depth um, kind of research that we would hope they'd have time but they don't always have time to do that. So that's an important aspect behind the scenes. It's not real, you know, um, out there, it's kind of, you know, a little bit boring if you don't like to do some learning, but I love it and I get so excited when you get you know, into the in-depth. I mean, a nonpartisan situation to learn stuff, hi, this is what we need. And so um, I welcome you into the fold if that it intrigues me at all. Now there, that's kind of long-term stuff, short-term stuff. Um, I ha helping organize a, a um, candidate forum. You know, basically people announce who's running, we help uh, get a situation together where they can have equal chances to answer questions, we have to come up with the questions, we have to time them, we have to follow some rules. And uh, having some different people involved in that always gives us some good diversity and of opinion about what we should be questioning those who are running for. Um, <clears throat> Some of the issues that we have studied, sustainability, local housing, um, water, diversity, redistricting, um, privatization, those are ones that we've all done studies on. And uh, currently, we're doing um, a study on mental health in Rock County and kind of how that's being affected, um, all of the different sources and services are trying to hone in on what where we can really see if we need some improvements and then uh, domestic violence we picked those two topics at our annual meeting in May and wow domestic violence has really been in the forefront um, we have a retired um, judge who's working with us and um, the head of the, uh, the YWCA who's working with us on really understanding what the breadth of the problem is so that our position is comprehensive. So um, if that stuff sounds interesting to you, that's great. If that doesn't sound interesting to you, maybe you just want to help us um, get some new voters registered. We need to really cover this county. There's people everywhere who have never been registered. It always floors me when we go out, you know, we have elections a couple times a year and there are still people who are not registered. Um, yes, we have new 18 year olds, understand that. Yes, we have new people who've moved in, understand that. But there are people who've lived here a long time who just at some point or another need to get engaged into the voting. We still have had only 15, 18, 20% of the um, 
total electorate show up at the last couple of uh, elections, and that, that frustrates me. Um, hopefully it bothers you a little bit. You don't need to get weird like me and, and go on about it, but um, maybe you could do something about it, and that would be helping people to get registered. So that's a little bit about the league. Um, I would like to ask all of those who are currently members of the league to stand, if you may. And someone's raising their hands, which means the same thing. That, so look around you, ask them if you're interested, ask them questions about the league. Um, they're more knowledgeable than I am about many things. Um, I think they just stick me up here because I don't mind a microphone. But um, I, I do have to say, some people have asked me about the t-shirt. Um, you do know the Justice League, right? So sometimes when I'm talking to my friends about the league, they like to assume that it's the Justice League, which it's not. Um, and then sometimes I have a, a kind of smart aleck friend, and he's, he's like, uh, is that the Extraordinary League? of women voters of justice you know he just like strings it all together so in honor of of some humor that we need to throw at this because everything can get us a little wound up um, that's what I try to do is is just find the way to to get people engaged and come in and and share their time with us so without any further ado um, oh wait I should tell you how you can join you can talk to me or any member at the end of this thing we'll, we'll get you signed up $65 for an individual, $90 for a household, and um, that's for a whole year. Gives you a membership in, federal, in the um, national, the state, and the local league all at once. Bam. You get a lot of good information, too. So without any further ado, I'm going to bring up my friend, Nancy Stab, who is going to introduce Mike McCabe. Thank you, Amy. It is my pleasure, my honor, to introduce to you tonight Mike McCabe, who is the author of Blue Jeans in High Places, The Coming Makeover of American Politics, and director of the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign, a nonpartisan watchdog group that tracks the money in state elections and works for reforms aimed at making people matter more than money in politics. What a novel idea. Before joining the Democracy Campaign staff in 1999 and becoming the group's director in 2000, Mike worked as the communi communications director and legislative liaison for the Madison Metropolitan School District. He previously directed a statewide civic education program and also worked as a newspaper reporter and a legislative aide. Mike served in the Peace Corps in West Africa, country of Mali. He was raised on his family's dairy farm in Clark County, Wisconsin, and is a graduate of the University of Wisconsin-Madison with degrees in journalism and political science. Let us welcome Mike McCabe. Thank you, Nancy, and thank you, Amy. Thank you to the Justice League of Janesville for, for inviting me to, to come. and. Uh, I'm honored to be among superheroes. And uh, I have to say that, that while I spent much of my childhood in Clark County growing up on a dairy farm, I have very deep roots here in Rock County. Uh, my mom grew up here in Janesville, and two of my sisters are in the audience, and my cousin Ron is in the audience. Uh, so I, I continue to have family living here. My parents, uh, after retiring from the farm up in Clark County, uh, moved back to Janesville and, and, uh, and lived here until they passed away some years ago. So this is a homecoming of sorts for me, and, and, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here. It also cracks me up to no end that there are the little kid blue jeans on the table, uh, on the tables around there. I, that, I didn't notice it at first, and then I was wandering b around back there, and I, I thought, oh my God, there are all these kid blue jeans on all the tables, and that, that cracks me up. Uh, uh, I, uh, I didn't come to talk about the democracy campaign tonight. If you don't know the democracy campaign, if you're not familiar with our work, I think it's enough for me to say that 
that I'm the director of a nonpartisan watchdog group. We specialize in tracking the money in state politics here in Wisconsin. It's our job to help the public follow the money trail. We also work for reforms, as Nancy said, aimed at trying to make people matter more than money in politics. And, and uh, I, I certainly invite you to, to check us out on the web and, and look into our group more. But that's all I'm going to say about the democracy campaign, because I, I really came tonight to talk about the condition of our democracy, not the democracy campaign. And specifically, I want to talk about what we can do to get citizens, ordinary citizens, back in the driver's seat of our government at a time when so many people are feeling that the major parties are failing us and, and when so many people are feeling politically homeless. Uh, that condition, the fact that so many people feel politically homeless, is not just my observation. I see it everywhere I go. I get a chance to travel throughout the state of Wisconsin to big cities, rural communities, and I, I encounter those feelings of detachment everywhere I go. But you don't have to take my word for it. It's in Gallup polling. It's in Pew Research. Every major media organization, their opinion surveying is showing the same thing. Academic institutions are picking up on it. Their research shows it. The percentage of Americans today who refuse to identify as either Democrats or Republicans is at its highest level in three quarters of a century. So many people are feeling disconnected from, disillusioned with the current political landscape. And if you are a loyal partisan, if you are a faithful Democrat, or if you are a loyal Republican, you still have to come to terms with the fact that so many of your neighbors, so many of your counterparts and peers in our society are, are feeling detached from your party, disgusted with your party. And there are powerful reasons for that. Now, I didn't come here tonight to give you lots of reasons why you should be disturbed by the current state of political affairs. You already know why you are disturbed by the state of political affairs. What I really want to talk about is how we need to come to terms with our own thinking and how we are actually active participants in our own disempowerment. The way we've been trained to think and talk about politics is playing a role. It's not just some forces that are doing this to us. It's also, in part, what we're doing to ourselves and how our own thinking is actually disempowering us. And I want to talk about some of those ways. And I write about it in this book. And I'll tell you a little bit later why I called it Blue Jeans in High Places. But, but the book is really about what I call door number four. And a little bit more on that later. But let me start with this. We have all been trained brainwashed, if you will, to, to think, to accept, or at least to be resigned to the assumption that there's only one form of capital, pol there, there's only one polit political currency that matters, namely money. We've all sort of bought in to an assumption that that we, there's this business model in American politics and there's nothing you can do about that business model. Now central to the current business model of American politics is the assumption that there is only one political currency that's relevant, namely money. The fascinating thing about that, and one of the reasons I was inspired to write this book, is that past generations knew that there were other political currencies that could prove enormously powerful. And we've been trained to forget them, 
We've been trained not to acknowledge their existence. And you have to admit, when you hear about a candidate for office who has little or no money, your instinct is to sort of dismiss them, to discount them. Ah, they don't have any chance. They don't have enough money. Certainly our media dismiss them, treat them as irrelevant. They're not viable because they don't have a huge campaign war chest. That's that assumption that we've been trained to accept. And what fascinates me is our great-grandparents and our great-great-grandparents did not embrace that assumption at all. In fact, they found political currencies, other political currencies that they put into circulation that proved potent enough to overcome the power of organized money in their time. And yet we don't think that that's possible. The other thing that is so troubling about the current business model of American politics is another assumption that we've accepted. That it's okay to have nonstop campaigning and perpetual fundraising. And yet we grumble and we gripe about the dysfunction and the division and the animosity and the rancor in the political world. And we, we, we are frustrated that that our Congress is so dysfunctional and that, and that our politicians can't seem to talk e to each other. And we mourn the loss of civil discourse and civility in general. The business model of American politics is lethal to civility, absolutely lethal to civil discourse. And let me tell you why. It used to be in our state, on this land, it used to be possible to run statewide for public office in our lifetimes, I'm talking. It used to be possible to run statewide for public office successfully and spend a few hundred dollars doing it. Bill Proxmire, for 30 years, got elected from Wisconsin to serve in Washington in the United States Senate. He never once, in any one of his campaigns, and he didn't lose an election for 30 years, he never once reached the $300 mark in one of his campaigns. And in his last run for public office, which he won by a landslide, with a well over 60% of the vote, Bill Proxmire spent $145.10 on his entire campaign. And you know what his biggest expense was? Postage to send back checks that people had sent him. He would send him a note and saying, you know, I, I appreciate the gesture, but I'm not taking any political donations, and so I'm returning your check. Thanks for your support. That was his biggest campaign expense, and he won going away. In 2012, we had a, a, a statewide election for governor, and $81 million was spent on that election. In a generation, we've seen our system go from a... a a place where it was possible for Bill Proxmire to run for, a, for $145 and win to a point where $81 million is spent electing a governor. That business model that has taken root, that produces $81 million elections, means that they never get to stop. Unlike Bill Proxmire's generation, when you would spend a few months campaigning for office, You'd raise a little bit of money, not so much in Proxmire's case, but most politicians, they were raising a little bit of money. They had some billboards to buy or some yard signs to put up. They needed a little literature to pass out. And, and so they would spend a few months raising money and a few months campaigning to voters. And then the winners of those elections would go into governing mode. And they would have to deal with all the other winners of all the other elections, some of whom were from the other party, to try to deal with our problems and try to solve America's problems. And that governing mode involved some compromise. It required some degree of collegiality. Civility actually came in handy. Today's elected officials really don't get to go into governing mode, ever because we've got campaigns that are so expensive that they are constantly campaigning, constantly fundraising. And, and that is lethal to civility 
and civil discourse. Because think about how you raise money. You raise money by talking about enemies, talking about how there are people who are seeking to destroy everything you hold dear. And unless you crack your checkbook right now and write out another check and send it in right now, these enemies are going to destroy everything you want. They're going to destroy life as you know it. That's how you raise money. That's not how you govern. And so we have a business model of American politics that is incompatible with democracy. It's incompatible with governance. It's lethal to civility. We need to become very familiar with that business model because it is our duty as citizens to ultimately destroy it. And I wrote this book to try to give people some recipes to do just that. Another way we've been trained to think that baffles me, but yet it's so much a part of the way we instinctively think and talk about politics. It's so deeply embedded, and yet it's so destructive. We have been taught to think and talk about politics horizontally. Who's on the left? Who's on the right? Who's in the middle? Who's liberal? Who's conservative? Who's moderate? A magical thing happens, an absolutely magical thing happens if you tip that horizontal political spectrum on its head and you think vertically instead of horizontally. If you stop thinking who's left, who's right, who's liberal, who's conservative, and you start thinking about who's on top and who's on the bottom. And I'm not just talking about money here. Not just who has the most money and who has the least, but who has the most political power, who has the least political power, who has the strongest voice in society, whose voice is weakest or most muted. Not who are the liberals and conservatives, but who are the commoners and who are the royals in society. A magical thing happens. Let me give you a, a practical example. Take a man living in Clark County where I spent much of my childhood. Clark County's farm country. To this day, there are more cows than people in Clark County. So chances are this guy's a farmer. He's white. He's probably poor. Clark County's one of the five poorest counties in Wisconsin. He's Republican. You would call him a conservative. Scott Walker won Clark County in 2012 by more than 30 percentage points. Now take a woman living in Milwaukee. Let's say she's a nursing assistant, a CNA. Chances are she's black. Chances are she's also having a hard time making ends meet. CNAs don't make a lot of money. She's Democrat. You'd call her a, con a liberal. On a horizontal political spectrum, those two people could not be farther apart. They have been trained to see themselves as enemies. Think vertically, think about royals and commoners, think about who's on top and who's on the bottom. Those two people are in exactly the same spot. Those two people have an enormous amount in common. And yet, the way we think and talk about politics is needlessly dividing people who could and should be united. That is not an accident. People in the political establishment understand that if you're counting votes, there are a lot more commoners than there are royals. They understand that for them to be successful, they have to drive wedges in between people who otherwise have a great deal in common because they can't afford those people to be united. If they're smart enough to think of doing that, we can be smart enough to undo that. And we have to be if democracy is to have a good future in this country. One of the, one of the other things that I marvel at is how much of a time warp we seem to have fallen into with our, our political vocabulary. And, and I want to give you a, a hint as to 
Well, I want to tell you why I named the book Blue Jeans in High Places. Uh, I was giving a talk at the Wisconsin Farmers Union State Convention. So I had 250 farmers in the audience. And I don't even know what possessed me to, to do this, but I, I speak without notes. I speak from the heart. And it dawned on me that to ask them if any of them owned a donkey. I don't know why. I said, anybody own a donkey? And not a single hand goes up. And I said, oh, come on. Somebody's still got to have a donkey on their land, and no one did. And I said, all right, how many of you own an elephant? And not a single hand goes up, of course. And I said, all right, now how many of you own a pair of blue jeans? Every single hand in the audience shoots up. And I said, all right, now what better represents you as a person and you as a people? A donkey, an elephant, or a pair of blue jeans? And what would better distinguish you from the suits on Wall Street and, and K Street where all the lobbyists prowl and on Capitol Hill? What better distinguishes you from those who seek to lord over you a donkey, an elephant, or a pair of blue jeans? And the reaction I got from that audience inspired the title of this book. We're stuck with two parties with symbols that date back to the 19th century. And those symbols bear absolutely no relevance to modern political life. Now, the politically homeless would probably say, well, they're apt symbols then, because these parties bear no relevance to my life. <laughs> and, and, you know, what, that, that got me to thinking. Our great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents understood something that we've been trained to forget. And that leads me to the last part of our training, our brainwashing, that I want to talk to you about. We have been trained to think that we have three choices as voters, and only three. We've been trained, so think of them as doors. Door number one, door number two, door number three. Behind door number one is whatever the two major parties offer us. Now, to people who are loyal partisans, they may be more or less satisfied with what they find behind door number one. Most Americans think that what is behind door number one sucks. Most voters are feeling like they're doomed to hold their noses and choose between the lesser of evils. And that is a reality that partisans need to come to terms with. Both parties need to come to terms with how people are feeling about them. Their brands are terribly, terribly damaged. Most people don't like what's behind door number one, so they long for door number two. Behind door number two, they find a third party or independent candidate. Problem is that door leads to a dead end. Whether it's Ralph Nader one time or Ross Perot another time, that third party candidate invariably finishes third. Third parties are aptly named. They almost always finish third. And so people are deflated. They don't feel that they got anywhere by choosing door number two. I'm not sure why people would, would be surprised by that, though, because America is a two-party system. We're not a European parliamentary democracy. In Europe, you've got a situation where competing factions can join forces and form coalition governments. You can have a sixth party or an eighth party join with a second party and become the first party and become the ruling coalition for the government. We don't have that in America. We have a two-party system. And, but yet, it's amazing, and it speaks to just how disillusioned people are with door number one when they keep choosing door number two, even though it leads to a dead end. And repeatedly, they are deflated by what they find behind there because it is a dead end. And that leads them to door number three. And behind door number three is withdrawal. It's resignation. It's 12% voter turnout in August. It's people heading for the sidelines, throwing up their hands and saying, look, if my vote isn't really going to make a difference, if my voice isn't going to be heard, I'm out. 
and that condition is endemic to American politics today. The politics, the politics of resignation are endemic to our system today. And that's what fascinates me. We have three doors. We've been conditioned to think that there are three doors. And what most Americans are finding behind the three doors, they think it sucks. And what, what's interesting is that past generations understood that there was a fourth door. And on more than one occasion, people opened that door. And when they opened that door, what they found behind it was transformational. It changed the political landscape. They changed the face of American politics by opening door number four. And they did it on more than one occasion. And I refuse to believe that we are less able than our great-grandparents or great-great-grandparents were. But we've been conditioned not even to acknowledge the existence of door number four, much less locate it and open it. And behind door number four is what I call a first party movement. And this is where I want to leave you. The difference between a third party movement and a, four, a, a, a first party movement is fundamental. First of all, third parties are destined to finish third. First parties movements have proven that they can finish first. Third party movements operate on the fringes of American politics. They organize to the left of the Democrats or the right of the Republicans. First party movements don't try to clip the wings of the party. They, they go straight for the heart. They seek to compete for the affections of all voters, not just those who are to the left of the Democrats or the right of the Republicans. Third party movements have at its, as its goal the creation of three or more political parties. First party movements focus on simply having at least one that's worth a damn, at least one that truly owes its allegiance to the people. And past generations have opened that door. And I write about a few instances where, where this has happened. I'll just give you two. The, the creation of the Republican Party is a wonderful story. And there are clues that you can draw from that that we could apply to modern times. At the time of, the, of, the, of slavery, the run-up to the Civil War, there were two major parties in America because we have a two-party system. Those parties were the Democrats and the Whigs. Both were pro-slavery parties. And people, there was this growing abolitionist movement. There were people calling for the end of slavery. They could not find voice in one of the major parties. They felt politically homeless. And what did they do? They fashioned a new political identity. They went into a little white schoolhouse in Ripon, Wisconsin, and they went into that building calling themselves Democrats or Whigs, or some of them were feeling so politically homeless they called, them thing, they called themselves things like free soilers. And they came out of that building united in calling themselves Republicans. A new political identity was established with an accompanying agenda. At its heart was the abolition of slavery. And that changed the American political landscape. Now you might note that at the end of that experiment, there were not three par political parties in America. There were two. The Whigs were driven to extinction. And the Republican label became one of the major political parties. And we, were, and we had the Democrats and Republicans. Now fast forward about a generation. Now we're in the time of the robber barons. Standard Oil is lording over people. The, the timber in barons and the railroad interests are lording over the people. Money, open bribery of public officials is a standard practice and doesn't become illegal in Wisconsin until 1897 for crying out loud. Think on that a second. Our, we became a state in 1848 and bribing a public official didn't become outlawed until 1897. For the first half century of statehood, it was perfectly legal to bribe public officials. And sure enough, a Republican leader offered a bribe to a 35-year-old attorney to fix a case, 
to fix a legal case. That attorney's name was Robert M. LaFollette. Bob LaFollette was so offended by that offer of a bribe that he said, you know what, I can't in good conscience call myself a Republican. My party has left me. And he started calling himself a progressive. And that identity grew, and that movement grew. And eventually, it led to sweeping reforms across the political landscape, corrupt practices acts, child labor laws, workers' compensation, unemployment compensation, the first system of taxation based on the ability to pay, the progressive income tax, a great progressive reform. The creation of a, a system of free public education all the way through high school, a the creation of a, a, a vocational, technical, and adult education system created right here in Wisconsin, the very first one in the country. All of these sweeping reforms in a matter of a few short years, and at the, as that progressive movement evolved, you might note that there were not three or four or six political parties in America. There were two. Both the Republicans and the Democrats felt compelled to embrace this new identity and the accompanying agenda. And you had Teddy Roosevelt running for president on the Republican ticket, but running as a progressive. And some years later, Woodrow Wilson ran as a progressive on the Democratic ticket. So they, they learned from the Whigs' mistake, and they weren't driven to extinction, but they reconnected to the people. They went to where the people were. And to me, there's a clue there. Every time there has been landscape altering political change in our country, the very first step that citizens took was the establishment of a new identity, the formation of a very bold political agenda that was associated with that identity. They thought very, very big. And it compelled the major parties to reconnect with them or perish. We have now come full circle. I see a little gray in the audience. I'm delighted to see some people who don't have any gray on top. But you all are old enough to remember Wisconsin when it was known as a beacon of clean and open and honest government. That was our inheritance. And it's an inheritance we've largely squandered. Because we can't honestly look into our own hearts and say that Wisconsin today is a beacon of clean and open and honest gov government. We have gone full circle back to the conditions of the Gilded Age, back to the conditions of the robber barons. But what we have to remember is that our own great-grandparents and great-great-grandparents faced Standard Oil. And the robber and the, the, the robber barons of the timber industry and the railroad industry, they were up against the Rockefellers and the Carnegies and the Vanderbilts and J.P. Morgan, and they beat them. And they beat them by fashioning a new political agenda, a new political identity, forcing political change within a two-party system. We face such remarkably similar conditions today. I just think this moment cries out for citizens to think as imaginatively and as creatively as past generations did. We don't have to make history here. We just have to repeat it. And I refuse to believe that we are less able of creating that kind of change than they were. We got more money than they had. We've got more education than they had. We have far greater means of communication than they ever hoped to have. And they beat the very kinds of forces that we are up against today. And I just close with this thought. Optimism is a political act. Those who seek to control us want us to be cynical. They want us to believe there is nothing that we can do to change our political fate. They want us to believe we have to accept things the way they are. They benefit when we are cynical. Cynicism is obedience. Optimism is an act of civil disobedience. I ask you to start tonight in engaging in some very healthy and constructive and much needed civil disobedience. And we start by being optimistic about our future. We start by realizing that we have it in our power to take back 
our democracy, restore that democracy to full health, we have it in our power to do what past generations have already proven can be done. These are not untested theories. These are ideas that have been put into practice. We can dust them off and put them into practice again, and we can beat the forces that we are up against. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have time for some questions? Yes. Oh, the, you know, the point was made that we have a lot more means of communication, but, but, that, but a lot of those means have been very partisanized, and does that actually hold us back? And that's a wonderful point, of course. Um, we have sort of a reemergence of partisan media. However, we do have to take into account that the, time, the times that I was describing, when the standard oils of the world, the the robber barons were overcome. There was highly partisan media at that time. I was just out in Gettysburg and had the delightful opportunity to go to, to prowl around the grounds and I went into the Gettysburg National Museum and it was fascinating reading the editorials up on the wall about Lincoln and Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. We, we think it's one of the most brilliant pieces of political oratory in the history of American politics. You should have seen these editorials mocking and ridiculing and, and absolutely lambasting Lincoln for his remarks, and then others that, that were praising him and saying it was one of the greatest speeches ever. Uh, so there have been periods when there's been highly partisan media, and we have sort of re-entered a, a period, which to me is actually another sign that we are coming full circle, that we are kind of coming back to conditions very much like those in the Gilded Age or even back to the conditions faced around the time of the Civil War. And each time that those conditions emerged, people responded. And they responded in ingenious ways, and they responded in ways that ended up changing the face of American politics. I think such a moment's coming again. Now having said that, we have the challenge of sort of refashioning media and trying to make it work for us. It's sort of being imposed on us and we have to figure out ways out. Uh, you know, when I go and talk to kids in school, and I was just at Mount Horeb High School, I was also up on the UW-Green Bay campus this week, when I talk to young people, I, I tell them that one of the reasons we've got this business model of American politics is because of TV. Candidates have to buy airtime on television, and America is the only major democracy on earth without some system of free airtime, enabling candidates to communicate with voters without taking out a second mortgage. And, but there's going to come a day when television will cease to be king in American politics, and some handheld device that hasn't been invented yet, but you all have an early incarnation of it, some handheld device will become the primary means of political communication. If we keep internet policy the way it is today, that could be revolutionary. That could change our democracy dramatically. And those policies are under fierce assault in Washington, D.C. right now. I think the powers that be understand that as the internet grows, as a, a political tool, they want to control it the way they've controlled television. Well, these are opportunities for us to break free of that control. And that's what I tell the kids. They have in their hands the ability to breathe life back into democracy, that, and that's one of the fights of their life. So we've got to imagine ways to get around the bad parts of today's media. But I also take heart in the fact that whenever there has been conditions similar to those that we face today, including a media landscape similar to, to what we have today, massive waves of reform have followed. And again, I, I have great faith that we are as able as past generations to make new massive waves of reform wash over the landscape. Yeah.
so many people voice an opinion and spin, but not nothing factual. Yep. And a lot of times no way to really check it. You know, what's your comment on that? And the question was about the death of objective journalism or the death of journalism period. And uh, a couple of thoughts. Um, I was trained as a journalist and worked for a time as a newspaper reporter. And, uh, and I saw the handwriting on the wall. I saw what was happening to the newspaper industry and didn't see a very bright future for myself as a, as a, a news reporter. And, and uh, I went into a different form of investigative journalism, shining light on money and politics through a citizen group. Uh, the reality is that newspapers are dying. The fact that newspapers were king had a lot to do with the fact that Bill Proxmire could run for office the way he did. The fact that television is king in American politics today is why we have $81 million elections for governor. There's going to come a day when television will no longer be the primary means of political communication. We have to be, we have to be actively engaged in shaping that new media landscape. I don't think we can recreate the days of Edward R. Murrow. We can't recreate the, day, the glory days of American newspapers. We have to be able to imagine what the next stage of responsible and high quality journalism might look like because we can't recreate these things that are dying away. They're dying away for reasons. So instead of trying to simply mourn their, their death or, or try to somehow resuscitate the corpse, we, we need to imagine how we can create responsible news reporting. And the only other thought I will share, again, here's a sign, a sign of our condition. And I'm sure I'm not the only one who feels this way. But it feels really odd to me that the best news, the news that actually contains the most truth, is often found on Comedy Central. <laughs> so fake news shows seem to contain a great deal more truth than the news shows that pass themselves off as authentic news. That is a sign that we are in deep trouble. But in the past, there have been people like Mark Twain and Will Rogers who played the role of Jon Stewart or Stephen Colbert. And you know, it was Mark Twain who coined the term Gilded Age. He gave that era its identity. He spoke out against the robber barons and did it with such wonderful humor. Thank God for humorists. They are about the only salvation that we have. Again, I take this as a sign, the conditions we face today, as a sign of how similar our challenges are to past generations. And I choose to draw hope from that because I know that historically, every time these kinds of conditions existed, up pops a Mark Twain, up pops a Will Rogers, up pops a John Stewart and a Stephen Colbert, and people figure out a way to get truth to the people. And people find ways to take advantage of that truth and make change. And, and it's gonna, we're in a dark moment. We're, we're in a very dismal moment in our political history, but it's darkest before the dawn. And I think these signs are signaling that something historic is about to happen. Something's about to pop. And we need to be smart enough because Lord knows those people who are seeking to control us are devious and they're thinking very strategically and carefully about how to, how to rig this system for their benefit. We've got to be just as creative and just as imaginative about how to get ourselves out of this mess. And, and recreating responsible journalism is going to be part of that. And I think that it's that handheld device that is going to play a major role, so we better figure out how to make use of it in a public-spirited way, a way that advances the cause of democracy rather than extinguishing democracy. Yeah? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, 
when I go around and speak to groups, uh, I, oh, I'm sorry, the question was, do I see anybody on, on the scene today who would take up the mantle of leadership? Anybody who seems like a likely prospect? When I go around and I talk to groups, depending on the political stripes of the people in the audience, I'll invariably get somebody who will say, isn't, isn't Elizabeth Warren the answer? Or isn't Bernie Sanders the answer? Or a different audience might say, isn't Rand Paul the kind of person who could take up the mantle of leadership? Or what about John Huntsman? And my answer to either audience is always the same. That is another way that we've been trained to think. It's another thing that's central to our vocabulary. You've been conditioned to refer to your elected officials as our nation's leaders, or our state's leaders, or our community's leaders. And actually, I think at critical moments, true leadership has always come from the citizenry. And when that leadership comes from the citizenry, there are always able politicians who run to the front of the parade and grab a drum or a flag. But think about it, even in our time. I could, I could give you a dozen examples, but I'll give you one. Gay rights and marriage equality. There was a time, a remarkably short time ago, when the Democrats weren't for gay, gay marriage. Barack Obama could not support anything beyond civil unions. The Republicans said it's got to be one man and one woman. Gay marriage absolutely has to be outlawed. And the best the Democrats could do is say maybe civil unions, but we can't go to gay marriage. And what changed the equation but the changing of the hearts and minds of Americans? And once the polls got to the point where clearly a, a majority of Americans had grown comfortable with the idea of gay rights and marriage equality, suddenly you had the Democrats saying, we're for gay marriage. And you had Republicans saying, our views don't really count. <laughs> it, what, what we think is irrelevant. It doesn't really matter what our position on gay marriage is. That's what you're hearing today. Now, are they, are they demonstrating leadership by saying those things? The leadership came from the citizenry. And, and that's what has always produced massive change. Lyndon Johnson wasn't engaged in leadership when he signed the Civil Rights Act or the Voting Rights Act. The leadership came from, from people who had hoses turned on them. It came from people who were kicked off of buses and out of lunch, off of lunch counters. And it came from people who marched. And it came from people who were, who were hanged and shot at. And they continued to push and they continued to build pressure until Lyndon Johnson had no choice but to sign those bills. He wasn't demonstrating leadership. He was taking his cues from the true leaders. And I, I think when real change comes to America, that's always been where, where it really originates from. So the next time you catch yourself talking about your nation's leaders or community's leaders or state's leaders, I just urge you to bite your tongue and say that they're elected officials who are supposed to be taking their cues from you. They're supposed to be following the wishes of the voters. They're supposed to be doing the will of the people. And we've got to get it into our minds that we are the leaders, that we're the ones that are supposed to make this change. And so instead of looking for a charismatic figure to lead this effort, we've got we've to take the advice that Cesar Chavez gave to a college student. When Chavez was approached, the kid knew that he was this legendary farm labor leader. And, and he said, what's the secret of organizing? And Chavez said, you talk to one person. And the kid said, no, no, no. I mean, how do you organize? And Chavez said, you talk to one person, and then another, and then another. And that's our, and, and I realize what I'm asking you to do is not a, a simple ask. We've, here's another bit of our training. We've all been conditioned to think that there's two things you do not talk about in polite company, religion or politics. I'm asking you to talk about politics in polite company. But when people have seen fit to do that, they've been able to change America. And there have always been able politicians, able 
public servants who ran to the front of the parade. And they will again. If we create an identity, if we create a movement, if we create an agenda, if we show them that this is where the people are, you'll find them at the front of the parade eventually. But we got to create a parade, a big parade. Other questions or comments? Yeah. Uh, the question started by talking about that I was talking about a third party and then brought up the Tea Party and how do they fit into this. The way I would answer that is that I am not, I am absolutely not talking about anybody abandoning the two major parties. I am not talking about the creation of a third party. That's door number two. I do not suggest that you open door number two. It's a dead end. I'm suggesting door number four. I'm suggesting the creation of a first party, not a third party, but a citizen movement that compels one or both of the major parties to reconnect with the people in a major way. And that's, that's a very different organizing strategy. That's a very different tactic. And one of the things that got me to thinking about this, I confess, was the Koch brothers and the Tea Party. You see, one of the Koch brothers was once on a presidential ticket. The vice presidential nominee of the Libertarian Party in 1980. Ran against Ronald Reagan. Reagan was not good enough. Not conservative enough. And these billionaire brothers got demolished. They, they, they were destroyed. Most, most of you probably don't even remember that there was a Koch brother on a presidential ticket in 1980. They're an they're irrelevant footnote in history. But they learned something from that experience. They learned that no matter how much money you got, no matter how much political clout you got, you can't operate outside of the two-party system in America and get anywhere. And they then spent 10 years planning the development and launching of the Tea Party. And what fascinated me about it is they weren't creating a party at all. They were creating an identity, a new brand that they would use to take over a party. And I don't think you can possibly call this a fringe movement. It's not a grassroots movement. There's nothing grassroots about it. It's pure astroturf. They've, they've spent millions designing it, devising it, filling buses with people to, to populate the rallies. It's pure astroturf, but you can't call it a fringe movement because look at the impact that it's had on one of the major parties. And I would say that that is a very selfish use of door number four. They did this for very self-serving reasons, to make the Republican Party even more subservient to them. Now, I've, I've used this line a few times. It, 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 is a, you know, it, it annoys loyal partisans, but I'm going to say it anyway. We've got one party that is scary and another that is scared. And I've said that to countless audiences, and I've yet to have a single person in a single audience say, which one is which? People instantly relate to what I'm talking about. And the reason that one party is so scary is that the other is scared and has allowed that party to become as scary as it is. Well, one of the ways that it's scary is that the Republican Party used to be the party of Lincoln. It used to be the party of Teddy Roosevelt. It used to be the party of Dwight Eisenhower. It used to be a party devoted to creating opportunity for all. And today, it is a party dedicated to serving the rich, protecting the rich from the rest of us. It, that's a simple truth. And it's being made more like that every day by the Koch brothers and by their movement. So what, what they've succeeded in doing 
is very self-serving. They've used door number four. They've used a strategy that has proven successful over time. They've used it to enrich themselves, to make the Republican Party more subservient to them than it has ever been. So what I thought is, if a couple of billionaires can use door number four so, so successfully for self-serving reasons, why couldn't citizens do what past generations of citizens did and use door number four for a much more public-spirited purpose, to promote the common good, to create a party that is much more connected to and, and, and in service of plain people. And, and that's not an untested theory. It's actually been done on multiple occasions throughout human history by plain people. And that's what I'm calling for today. I'm suggesting that we at least be as smart as Charles and David Koch. They realized what didn't work, and they saw a door that we've been trained to ignore, and they opened it, and they used it for their own selfish purposes. I'm suggesting let's use it for our purposes, because the door is there, and it can be opened. Thank you. Okay, so if you don't feel some energy after that, you, you may need to check your pulse. And basically what, uh, you know, what we would like you to know about the league is that we may or may, I haven't read his whole book or anything, I, we may or may not agree with every point, but we do agree with getting people involved. And if this gets you excited about getting involved in voting and getting your friends to vote and getting your family to get engaged and pay attention, we've done our job here. Um, join us if you'd like. Hang around for a while if you want. We've got plenty of food and drink. And thanks again for coming. Thanks. Let's give another hand to Mike.